Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to another early game playbook guide video as we're covering Liu Chong, the Prince of Chen, in the 182 Mandate of Heaven start. Now this is his default start, as he was added in during the Mandate of Heaven DLC. And we're going to be approaching the rest of this guide series with factions that we have completely not covered in their default setting. So that means after Liu Chong, we won't be doing any of the 182 right away because all the unique ones have been covered. We covered Liu Hong, the three Zhang brothers, and Lu Zhi, and now we're covering Liu Chong. Then we're going to jump into 194 next week, starting off with Lü Bu, before moving on to Sun Ce, which are the two unique factions added in during A World Betrayed. Then for Face Divided, we'll be taking a look at Liu Yan. This way, we will have covered every single faction and faction mechanic using the early uh, guides, uh, not including the Eight Princes, of course, and the expansion pack in A Furious Wild. We'll be doing those after we finish the chapter pack dates. And this way, everyone can at least refer to one guide to get used to the faction mechanic for every single faction in the game. If we have time in the future after completing these, we'll come back and do the various different starting date for the same factions. Because there's really a lot less to cover once we cover the basic off the faction mechanics in these guides. Now, continuing with Liu Chong here, he is fairly easy faction to play. Starting situation easy, very accurate, because in 182, everyone is a friend. You are a subject to the Han Empire under Emperor Liu Hong. He is your uh, nephew. And what we can do here is basically hang out, develop ourselves, fight off some looters and early rebel groups that will spawn near us before moving north to wipe out the three brothers. And that pretty much ends the game. Uh, you could continue to play until Liu Hong dissolves his empire following his death. And then you can play out as a warlord, triggering three kingdoms, wiping out the two other emperors and uniting the land under your banner. So speaking of what makes this faction unique, he has the trophy cabinet, which is a collection of bonus items similar to Lu Zhi's library. And aside from that, you also have a unique mechanic in terms of a resource that we'll look at once we get into game. It's actually not written here, which is actually kind of strange, but we'll talk about it once we see it in game. In terms of unique units, we have two. Chen Royal Guards and Chen Peacekeepers, available at level 3 and level 6 for all generals. Both of these units are very powerful, very strong crossbow units. Uh, the Chen Peacekeeper is a melee cavalry first, but has a second weapon, which you can switch to for range in a crossbow. A very powerful melee cavalry, because the fact that you have uh, the range option, as well as all the anti-missile bonuses of a melee cavalry, and all very high stats for both of these units, including good melee stats as well for the Chen Royal Guards. In terms of range damage, they do the exact same damage as a regular crossbow unit. So you might just want a few of them early on as sort of your frontline unit because they have great armor and great stats, so they can actually take melee hits. And the backline you can reserve for regular crossbow units until you can afford complete armies of Chen Royal Guards. Now the advantage of these units is that they're available for all classes. So crossbows are only available for commanders and strategists, whereas you can have these on generals like Sentinels, which has a lot of range boost. So that will work very well together. And that goes the same for Chen Peacekeepers, just requires level six or higher. Overall, very good, but very expensive units. Uh, that you can definitely spam and win the campaign because crossbow typically deals the most damage. Very high base damage, very high armor piercing damage on these unit, and they have good amount of ammo compared to regular crossbow units. Then on top of that, as our only unique character that we start out with our main character, Liu Chong himself, uh, we have some basic traits, nothing too crazy here. We do get five points of satisfaction and our background bonus gives us cheap recruitment cost, 20% discount for all Chen units, which are two unique units, 15% extra range damage for crossbows, and plus three starting rank for all range units. So you can see that we are heavily 
focused on range unit. And this is all going to play into using our unique units to help us win the campaign. So with all that said, we're going to be jumping in here, showcasing this once again on Legendary Legendary 40 minutes. So let's hop in here. China must be united. Ruin 带来太平Alrighty, so that was our flyby introduction. We are the Prince of Chen. You are Liu Chong, a scion of the Imperial Line, having narrowly avoided the headsmen for the improper worship of Huang Lao. You seek to prove your virtue to the Emperor. You are a master warrior and statesman, seeking to fan the flickering flames of the Han Dynasty. Your close friend and colleague, Luo Jun, has promised to aid you in your quest, and we are to build a land of prosperity, be wary of Yuan Shu to the south, Luo Jun will be your guide. First mission, to engage Wei Teng again. Seems like every uh, beginner battle is to fight Wei Teng in the Mandate of Heaven. We get a very unique bonus. Your legend spreads 10 turns of plus 10 public order and minus 10% recruitment cost. It is a very unique approach. We start out with one of each of our unique unit and one regular crossbow. If we compare, you see that the damage is exactly the same. The firing rate is exactly the same. As is range, the big difference is ammo. Ammo is where this unit wins in terms of range component. But if you look at the combat stats, it's night and day. Crossbow has eight base damage, two armor piercing versus seven and 23 armor piercing on the Chen Royal Guard, plus 53% armor and 17% armor from shield. And because they have a big shield on their back, 55% range block chance and 12% evasion on the armor, 20% from the shield versus almost no defensive stats on the crossbowmen. So defensively speaking and melee speaking, Chen Royal Guard outclasses the crossbow by a ton. 9k more health and way more morale. So that's why when I say in the early game, you do want a few of these Chen Royal Guards. Um, they also cost about three times as much to upkeep. You could have just basically two of them and recruit the rest as regular crossbowmen, place them behind. So essentially you have the same amount of range damage output and have the same amount of defensive uh, kind of frontline abilities as going all Chen Royal Guards. Alright, before we jump into this fight, which is a very simple fight, it's not always going to be this class of character and these units. This is random on every single game. Sometimes he will be a strategist, sometimes he will be a champion, sometimes he will be a sentinel, sometimes he will be uh, the commander here. And his traits will be different every time, so you can't consistently uh, get a general that would duel you or um, would be captured and be a nice use because sometimes I see him as a champion with a very useful background like say farmer with traits like humble and tranquil and you could capture him and try to use him but in most instances the best way to approach this is to fight this manually and have Liu Chong duel him and pick up as much experience as you can because you start out at level 4 your goal is to get him to level 6 there are two good things that will happen when you hit level 6. One, if you pick up Meditation into Show of Force, you end up with the most powerful ability in the game. It is absolutely broken because it's unlimited use. It's a single piercing arrow 
It does 3.8k range damage and minus 15 morale. You have to target something and it only has 60 second cooldown. You can literally wipe out any general you want with this ability. From far away, you can wipe out most of the enemy forces. We have done guides before uh, with Notron where he started off with this ability. He used to start off with this ability on launch until we did a guide that showcased how you can wipe out Cao Cao's entire faction by turn three uh, in the 190 start with our old guide, if you're interested, check it out. And then CA promptly changed it so that he doesn't start with show of force anymore because it is, it is broken. So our goal is to reach level six. So if you can duel, if you can get him as many kill kills as you can, um, against the commander class is actually pretty difficult because these units are hard to deal with. They counter range and they also counter generals. So this would be actually one of the worst combinations you can get. Uh, but essentially, this is obviously an easy fight given what you have, your higher level. He's always going to be accepting your duel. You can definitely kill him. And not only do we get a cool skill once we get six, there is also the matter of trophies. So there are 20 different types of trophies. Each of them are named after an item and the conditions to unlock them are listed below. Like say here, win five siege battles when commanding the army. This means Liu Chong is the commander of the army. That is key. And you have 15 battles, you know, win 15 battles, rank up melee cavalry units 15 time, um, reach Marquis rank, that's quite simple. You get five artillery units or siege weapons, uh, rank up five units of artillery, have 15 crossbow units, all sorts of different various uh, bonuses for these conditions. And some of them are really powerful, like double the ammo of artillery units or increase the range damage of artillery units. Um, reduce 15% upkeep for crossbow units. Some of these are really, really nice. You can have up to four of them displayed and activated once you unlock them. We get the Imperial Banner for free on turn one. It is part of an early game uh, quest item. We also got a Shaman. Doesn't matter if we get these, we're not gonna use them in our guide. You always start out with two silver weapons, one for yourself and one for Luo Jun. You are a faction of only two generals. You start out with a unique gold horse called the Ebon Prince. Uh, it's pretty decent, nothing amazing. It's a bit slow in my opinion, but um, it's not a bad horse. You don't start out with any followers, but you do start out with a stone pig. Luo Jun also gets a silver weapon, silver horse, and a gold armor. And he has the burn trait, a pretty decent background of 10% income to all sources, which means you could consider adopting him once you have 4,000 in the bank to make him your heir. Uh, that is an option. Uh, Charismatic also will give five points of satisfaction if you choose to do so. Or else he makes for a pretty decent administrator as well with the 10% income from Burnt and the three public order from Charismatic. So that's Luojun for you. And we will try to use him. Uh, in the early game, you have eight turns to set yourself up for a round of looters. Your land will be hit by three or two to three looter army, depends on how the game spawns them. And that's what you have to deal with on turn eight. After that, your job is just to finish off the old turbans. You are not gonna get any threat from any of the Han factions until the empire dissolves closer to the year uh, 190. So plenty of time, right? So you don't have to worry about that part. Uh, you are kind of restricted in terms of what you can build because the fervor mechanism is a bit annoying. So what you end up need to stay away from is the tax collection building in Mandate of Heaven because of the plus four and eight fervor. If you're playing in 190, you could go with this building because you don't have fervor to deal with and peasantry uh, synergize quite well with the land you have. So for our run, we're probably gonna end up going with state workshops for most of the build to prepare them for a future corruption reduction sort of build up. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do uh, before we jump into the fight is diplomacy. This is actually gonna be quite time consuming if you're playing uh, a real campaign. For the purpose of the guide, I'll talk about what I recommend you to do, but not do everything because it takes way too long. The first thing you can do is look at every single faction for their items to see if there's anything you would like to trade for. 
that is uh, only available on turn one. And the second thing you want to do is get a trade deal. There are a couple candidates for this, and when you are considering who you might want to trade with, um, I recommend trading with Yuan Shu first, because he has a lot of neighbors that he can sign pe uh, trade deals with, whereas um, you know Chu Gong might not have that much option. He can sign it with Liu Hong, but Liu Hong starts out with a lot of bureaucracy problems, so he can't really trade much. So he might be still around when you get more trade partners available. So that's the purpose here, is we want as many trade as possible early on, and we're landlocked, we don't have a port, so we don't have that many options, right? High Empire, uh, Yuan Shu, Chu Gong, Liu Hong, Qiao Mao are pretty much our only options. So we're going to start out with Yuan Shu here. Meow. We can get two points, and we have six food actually. We have tons of excess food, and you can offer them up and get money. You can also take a look at military access. Now, his is negative, but there is a lot of positive military access available for you because a lot of people like you. And you can basically just try to get the best deal you can early on. So in this case, we'll just grab this. And this is the part that I'm going to skip. You see how many factions are willing to sign deals? Some of them are 4.0, 3.5, 5.9, 4.3. 6.0 you can get a lot of money this way just by signing turn one military access non-aggression is not going to work because you already have default non-aggression by being subjects with uh, everyone to Liu Hong uh, the only faction that's not is Ma Teng with the um, eventual Liao rebels uh, we don't have to worry about this but this is where we get most of our early game money from diplomacy from trade and after you do these deals, you can easily get around 2,000 income per turn. And not only that, we're going to do the fight now because we did our trade deal. And we're just going to delegate this to save time. Uh, if you are playing it, highly recommend you to go duel so that you can pick up a good chunk of experience here. Now the reason why delegate's not going to mess this up is we're going to get rid of most of our units early on. And here is another faction mechanic, Fortitude. That is our unique resource. You gain Fortitude by dealing damage to enemy units. The more units you kill, the more Fortitude you get. So in this case, very small army. Uh, it's probably the worst roll we could have gotten because not only have I mentioned that melee cavalry are difficult to deal with early on, they also come in quarter size unit size. So 30 units each and Fortitude uh, it's given to you based on how many you kill. So if you got, you know, D infantry or archer militia here, you could get up to three to four points of four to depend on how many of them you chase down and kill. In this case, we only get one point and we'll get some income on top of that. We didn't capture him. That's fine. It would just been extra 200 income. Essentially, we get your legend spread. This is a very useful bonus for our first army. And also because of the public order, once we reach our second Marquis rank, we can raise taxes, uh, which will drop public order by minus six and minus 15 for the two different tiers. So at least you can get it to minus six. Our next mission is to equip the Imperial banner, the item in our trophy uh, cabinet. And we get this, the Prince of Chen bonus and a thousand treasury. I recommend holding off on this. Um, of course, there is another strategy that you can go is you ignore this bonus if you want to utilize this bonus for, for your first army you would want to wait at least till turn three to activate this because what happens then is you will be able to enjoy this bonus for your first army which i recommend you recruiting around turn seven and minus two mustering turn will save you about five percent uh replenishment and then the two percent extra for one turn about seven percent gain there it's not a big deal. Uh, the disadvantage of holding back on this is you don't trigger the next mission, which will grant you 20 points of prestige, which will actually push you over to the second marquee. So you can actually raise taxes earlier. You can even get court positions earlier uh, to the point where you can pick up some faction council potentially next turn. So we're going to showcase that playstyle. Just note that if you want to 
utilize this bonus, you can hold off on when you equip the banner. Right, that's always an option you have. Now that was the only looter army on the map, but they will come back. So we're gonna immediately add this banner for 10 points of morale for melee cav. We'll activate this right off the bat. We get this bonus that's kind of useless. And the next mission is constructor upgrade a building. Has the prince commands, 20 points of prestige. This is what will push us over. So what building can we finish in one turn is going to be the key, right? If we have a building that we can finish building in one turn, then essentially you can activate the bonus by next spring, AKA next turn, and you can put officers into the positions that can give you faction council. So the only building that really fits is either the cons conscription building or the government support. You can go with either. Uh, there are different advantages to uh, them. Conscript, uh, conscription is not bad in that you get plus two starting rank, but you start losing some population, which will be counteracted entirely by your land development here. Uh, there are some synergies to the amount of food and peasantry income you will get. So it's not terrible for government support either. There's pros and cons for both. If you're going to end up recruiting your first army in Chen, um, this will be really good. So. I actually recommend going for the conscription just for that first burst of uh, experience for your first army and just to get an easy finish here. Uh, it's going to be a utility build commandery anyways. You level this up, you end up building a state workshop, and that pretty much is the build uh, for this entire commandery. So that's done. Now we can get rid of our units. We don't need them. They're too expensive, 440 for each of them per turn. 320 for each of them per turn and the crossbow can go as well well because now when we do recruit a new army we get the plus two rank he can also come back we don't need him to be on the field and he has the liberty to be redeployed anywhere we want over here get rid of the patrol building it costs upkeep money and we don't need it and in its place we're going to put a state workshop and that's pretty much it that's all we have to do on turn one and we're ready to go so let's continue here. Alrighty, uh, Cheng Gui dies. And we pick up as the Prince commands, which immediately pushes us to second Marquis. We pick up more money and we get this rank up. Hold off on this for now, because there is going to be some decision to be made about what points we actually push up for the prestige points. First, get a reform. I highly recommend going for the extra trade routes early on, leading to the Onyx Dragon approach. Now, we don't need Onyx Dragons because we have really good range unit, but this build is good because it gives you access to level three and level four state workshop very quickly and private workshop and level three in. So basically you have a default commerce and industry build set that you can use, which is really good for early game economy when you can't uh, go tall. So I think this is probably the best approach into picking up a few of the extra trade routes. They're a good source of income in this setup in Mandate of Heaven because everyone is too friendly in the beginning. And you're always hoping that when the Yellow Turban Rebels spawn, that Tiamal loses Dong because that is a port city and that you can recapture it so that you can control a port city to trade with the rest of the map. That's going to be crucial. Now that we have a trade route, we can take a look at how many factions we can trade with. So you see here, we can trade with three factions. So that means when we come to do our rank up, we want two more trade agreements to make sure we have the maximum number of trade agreement without wasting any. And we mentioned many times before, you get exactly 24 points total to fill out at most three bars to the max. And if you don't you know, if you diversify into a fourth bar, you're only going to get max out two bars. And I typically like to max out the army for the upkeep cost and either the assignment for the character salary cost or maybe administrator just because administrators are strong. In this case, trade agreements, not terrible because we have the 25 points of diplomacy bonus here. And given how many friendly factions we'll have, maxing out the trade is not a bad approach either. So we have very few characters. There's no point to up the assignments. We 
barely have anyone to do the current assignment because Dotron has other jobs to do. I want him on the field. So this is not useful. What I think is best is actually grab at least one spy and then one administrator. We start with the reform unit secretary that gives us one administrator. We haven't assigned him yet, but we have one. Now we have two and we have exactly two commanderies. So we'll be able to fill both positions with this setup here. Uh, this means you can only fill two bars to the max and then diversify the last eight points into the remaining three bars. And I'm okay with that. The spy is crucial because it allows you to check turncoats. And now we can uh, take a look. Currently no turncoats, but should anyone become available, we can grab them from the start. Alrighty. Uh, we get the mission of assigning any character to the Chancellor position and you receive a reward from Luo Jun. We'll get our crossbow from him. Now, your game is going to start have deviations from our game uh, starting this turn in that there is a chance you get characters to recruit. We actually got very unlucky in that we didn't get any candidates. The best candidates I have seen this early is Liu Yan. Usually three characters show up. Um, if they don't, it's fine. Uh, what you want to do here is recruit the unique. You can get people like Liu Yan, people like Zhou Tai, Yu Jin, Huang Zhong. Basically anyone who's deemed factionless at the start of the 182 has a very good chance of just spawning into the player's recruitment pool. So don't worry about the fact that you start out with almost no character. You're going to have a roster of very nice looking unique characters very, very soon. What we're going to do temporarily is assign Lord Zhu not to the Chancellor to get the bow because there's no rush. We're going to assign him to either Grant Excellency for 15% industry or uh, for the Grant Commandant for 10% recruitment. Uh, we can flip flop during any turn. Right now, I think even though we have no industry, I do plan on building a state workshop. So I'm going to put him here for now. We're not recruiting anything until turn six or seven. So we're going to put him here for now. And the reason why we want him assigned there is so we can do our faction council. We timed everything for this spring so we can get this going. It's currently recommending trade deals. We don't do this because we can do the trade deals ourselves and it will change what is offered. So we got these deals on purpose and you can give everyone one food to just spice up. The first food is 1.5. It's worth quite a bit. Now with the little transaction, he has a lot of cash. He doesn't actually have income because of the Unix. And we can get just a little bit of cash from him and that's gonna be really all we can get. And that's fine. And you can always take a look at military access. Some of them are very positive. Take advantage of that. Now, because everyone is paying tribute to the emperor, everyone's pretty poor, to be honest. And even though this one's negative, he doesn't like us. If we throw him one food, we can make it work. He's probably not going to pay us anything, but we can probably get cash. Yeah, 50, probably just a little bit more. Let's say 65. Sounds good. And we maxed out our trade deals. And our income is at 3,500 uh, with plenty in the bank. This is a very good sign. We are going to get that state workshop so we can start making money now. And we're waiting for characters to show up for us to recruit. So coming back here, you see that one has refreshed. Now we get a chance to increase our peasantry income and population growth for free. Let's do that. And you see that our income is 38. Remember how? We have the extra public order, so plus 10, plus 8, raising at once will not hurt us at all. We can increase tax rate now that we are second marquees and our income is close to 4,000 without doing any of the military access selling that I recommended. So clearly you can have around 4,000 pretty easy at this point, and we're just going to continue here. Oh, by the way, we mentioned fortitude, but we didn't take a look at it. It's not a big bonus, it's just the effect that you have. It's a decaying resource. It has four tiers, 50 point each, maximum 200 points. 
And at the first tier, you get minus one decay per turn, minus two, minus four, minus eight. Uh, it's not a big deal. If you fight like a regular size battle, full army versus full army, you can get about 15, 16 points of fortitude easy uh, without any problems just by winning. And you get bonuses like immune to scaring, minus eight for defending enemy force means when you're on attack, they automatically lose eight points of morale. When you're on defense, you get plus eight. So there's always an eight point buffer, whether you're on attack or defense. And the minus eight when you're attacking is really good because you can do night battles to make that figure essentially 23 and then add in some fire. They're routing very, very easily. Eight points of experience per unit per season is very, very low. Uh, that's kind of, you can ignore that. They just picked eight, I guess, to make things uh, sound like a lucky number. And six points for the third tier, four points, and two points for the first tier. Um, it's a good bonus to have. It never hurts. There's no bad, uh, you know, trade-off here. It's just a bonus for you, and you can build it up by fighting. That's essentially what this is. There's nothing special about it. It's not very deep. Um, it's just straight positive for you at all times. And we got this done. We could upgrade this for a seasonal deployment, but given how little generals we have. That's not needed. Uh, you can choose to upgrade this to eventually a small city if you want, uh, but it's actually quite pricey before you get an administrator. And we don't have administrator because we don't have characters. Once we do, uh, things will be better. So typically I just wait. There's no need to rush any of this development. Let's just continue here. Now it's just a few turns of how lucky we are in terms of getting characters. And I have to say this run is extremely unlucky and I'm okay with that. Uh, just showcasing what happens when we don't get anyone. Next turn, typically, uh, is a turn where characters show up. We can always check for turn coats. Nobody in that front either. Um, he can stay here. You could also move him into Administrator if you're this desperate for characters. Because the bonuses and the salary he gets for this tier is really not worth it this early on. So in this case, I would recommend shifting him. And we want to build up Chen, so let's put him there. Plenty of peasantry for him to boost as well. And now we can come in there and build some stuff. It'll be a little bit cheaper, 40. He doesn't have a lot of expertise. Um, yeah, we'll upgrade this slowly. He'll get experience for that build, and we can continue from here. All right, we finally get some characters. Moment of truth, Zhang Hong, Zhou Tai. So here's two. Uh, unique legendary generals for us to use and they all come with clean records with no past histories therefore we can feel free to recruit them without any worries and here comes our general buildup and you can always look at others because you're you know in need of good administrators so if you see someone um, who might be helpful i mean in this case perceptive into patience uh, it's not bad Liu Hong can spy, so you do have to be slightly concerned. Nothing too great here. And just because they're generic doesn't mean you shouldn't look, because there's actually a lot of generics with very unique backgrounds in this start date. People like Zhang Wen, people like... Um, there's another bonus that gives like 100% to commerce income faction-wide. There's the minus 100 corruption reduction. There's all sorts of really wacky ones that you could pick up uh, in this start. So just take a look at everyone. Uh, now that we have two characters, Zhang Hong, given that he does have some, uh, let's call it administrator traits, uh, not, not like the perfect administrator by any means, but because we lack characters, he's gonna get that job now. And be flexible with your court. When it's spring, move them up so that you can get the faction council when it's summer move them back down and so forth Zhou Tai is going to be very useful and we're going to um, try to use them in a particular way around turn seven because turn eight as we mentioned is where all the action starts all right we got some item that's really all we need to do hire them put them in uh, over here we can continue to build and the best option is actually to continue to build the state workshop because it gives the most incremental income increase of all the buildings that you could use here. And ideally, we 
might want to level this up again, do a private workshop, or if you find better land, just get rid of this. Go for either conscription or a government support just to make this utility as well. The state workshop you're always keeping because it will become a corruption reduction building later on. Uh, stay away from assignments. There's really no need for any of these. They're coming onto the field uh, very soon. If you ever find yourself with fervor problems once you go north, Commanders are really good at reducing fervor. This is basically what you need to get rid of fervor issues in Mandate of Heaven. If you don't want to do that, all you need to do is wipe out the three brothers as quickly as you can, and fervor will just disappear from the game. All right, let's continue. All right, Liu Hong declare war on Zhang Bao. Good for him. Have five units of missile infantry in Liu Hong's army, and we get five more turns of recruitment bonuses. Um, Basically, you have 10 turns to do this, and then you basically get 5 more turns when you recruit your first army, which kind of doesn't make sense because then, I mean, it's nice to extend the public order, but the recruitment cost isn't going to get any lower by the, uh, by any means. We're going to wait. Uh, turn 6 is going to be winter. Turn 7 is going to be spring. Spring is also when we're going to shift characters into Grand Commandant, which means 10% recruitment discount uh, so that we can actually get our armies cheaply. On that turn as well so everything's going to line up we're just going to check spy and you see that some turn codes are available if you are interested in grabbing them uh mommy d actually has a unique background but the bonus is pretty bad so just pass let's continue here Alrighty, turn six factions joining the war doesn't really matter another chance at unique characters xun yu is coming to us uh Guan Chun has perceptive but uh not anything too good there We'll be grabbing Xun Yu to join us. And he is a brilliant general. So an army of Xun Yu, Luo Jun, and Liu Chong is going to be very good for range armies. And we're going to start setting them up despite not recruiting uh, the army yet. The reason why we're setting them up this turn is because I'm going to have three seasonal deployment and I'm going to want to deploy about four generals next turn. So we're going to start this turn to lessen our demand next turn. We're going to pop Liu Chong out at the edge here. This is where we're going to... Actually, I might change my mind. Usually, I want to recruit here, but because we have the plus two rank, I might want to put them here, which means he might have to come back, which doesn't hurt. He's free to recruit. Yeah, this is an interesting situation because usually I prefer to recruit over there. But now, given our situation, it might be better to recruit over here. Essentially what happens on turn 8 is the rebellion starts. We get three looters spawn. The looter typically spawns outside of Chen, outside of Chen farmland, and outside of Inchuan farmland. Chen is very safe because we have a garrison, but he's going to come out into an army, so... Essentially, we need an army around here. This is the most vulnerable because the game has a mechanic where it disables you from raising an army here when they spawn, which is very weird. But after a few testing rounds, it's pretty much essential that you recruit someone here now or before turn 8 or else you're not allowed to recruit them. So I'm going to actually put him here because he's going to be holding down the fort here. Hmm. In this case, we're flipping it because I'm actually one of recruiting. Alright. Luo Jun will... Actually, Xun Yu will come out. It's okay. A lot of wasted moves, but in the end, it'll work out. We're going to recall Zhou Tai. And we're also going to recall Liu Chong. We have plenty of cash saved up to make a first army without any issues. I just wanted to get this bonus because local here means local commandery. Means if I want my first army to be the Liu Chong, Luo Jun, uh, Xun Yu army, I need them to be in Chen. And the place in Chen that we need to defend is this location here. Whereas over here, uh, maybe Zhou Tai with the garrison is enough. What about, we're going to find out. So let's just go next turn first. Nothing really to look at here. And no buildings. 
no changes here. Actually, small change, but nothing too interesting. So let's continue. All right, relationship build up between two of them. More characters. Huang Gai is available. He's willing to spy, so he's not a spy. He just basically left Sun Jian. It's very common. Um, leaving Liu Hong, I would just trust this. I mean, even if he's a spy against your faction, it's probably not going to be too damaging. So you see that you can get a very nice roster without trying, pretty much. And what we're going to do is recruit our first army now. Liu Chong comes here. Zhou Tai joins the army. The goal is to build up relationship so Zhou Tai can pick up um, his Oathworn ability. We're going to shift the court positions a bit. Um, for these characters, we could... I mean, Huang Gai, we're definitely recruiting. Not even worried because he's not a spy. Comes with a lot of good items, too. There's a potential chance that uh, Xun Yu is a spy. So once we recruit him, keeping him at close to 100 points of satisfaction is going to be pretty key. So I think we just maybe keep him in this position. These two are decent enough administrators, so we can hold off on swapping them. The only person I think could be swapped is Zhang Hong is not as good as Xun Yu. But Xun Yu has the burn trait. But Xun Yu is going to be on the field, so there's a trade-off there as well. We're just going to throw Wang Gai in there. We have the income to you know, afford them in high positions. He picked up a level. We're going to be combat focused here despite him being administrator right now. He might not stay administrator. So we're just going to shift over here like this, picking up I me. Mean, ideally, we want reach. So maybe like curling this way first. Pick up a reform. Um, I don't think there's any more trade partners. So you could shift over here for level three state workshop. And look at Faction Council. Skill Tree Reset could be very helpful if you don't want Scholarship because it's not that good. If you are, you know, combat focused, you could have him pick up Resourcefulness instead. If you don't mind him being Administrator, then you have him keep that as well. Uh, increasing Build and additional Build Slot plus Construction Time Discount. That is actually extremely valuable. So I would say just have him have one bad skill is not a big deal. Over here, have the army pick up extra rank, extra experience, exactly what we want. And we can start recruiting after we hand out a title. So general off the left to kick off recruitment with the discount. And we don't need to be too ambitious. Oh, make sure Dotron is leading. A lot of the trophies require him to be leading. 540, 320, the upkeep's gonna stay the same. As we mentioned, you want two of them, and then crossbow going cross. You would like some siege weapons as well. It would be very helpful. Uh, I would recommend staying away from juggernauts because we don't have a front line. Just go tribuche, keep Zhou Tai alone. Um, once he pick up Oathorn, he's gonna be unstoppable. If he ever gets hurt, you can just recall, resummon. And uh, this army is prepared. We have this location to guard, which can become a little tricky. And we're going to send out someone who's not uh, a administrator right now. I know we mentioned that we wanted Luo Jun here, but because he's actually defending it by being the administrator, I'm going to keep him off the army right now and let Zhou Tai shine. If Zhou Tai is not available, I say he never showed up, then Luo Jun would be a great placement here. Over here, we're just going to send out probably Huang Gai just because he's highest level plus he has a weapon to help us out defend this. And we can send him help next turn if we need to. And if you find yourself with money issues, look at the public order. It's totally fine to increase it. Even if this start going negative, you can easily beat back the rebels that spawn there just so that you maintain some positive income. Uh, remember, if you sold your military access, you should have at least a couple hundred more than this right now. 
and you're going to pick up a couple items next turn just because you recruited enough range units to satisfy some of the conditions, I believe. Or maybe not. Maybe you need 15. But anyways, this is a pretty good army setup for Neutron's faction. Just remember that before you end turn, go back to the general of the left, switch him to general of the right for upkeep discount switching, and you'll make the best of your income situation. Uh, if you're not using Lord Jin, consider giving him a better weapon, even though he probably doesn't need it. Um, Joe Tai just kills people by ramming them down. Alright, we're good to go. Let's go to turn 8. Um, building wise, finish this upgrade to small city. If you have extra characters, you can consider assign assigning them out to assignments. There is some commerce here. Pick up some income there. And that's it. Alright, so this is the turn 8 uh, rebellion turn. And you basically get all the revolts. You finish the mission of having five missile units or missile units. You get the five more turns of public order boost. This is your mission. This is the kind of surprise if you haven't played Dotron's faction. You're going to have looter factions spawn all around you, and you have to beat three of them. Remember, beat three armies. If you can fight an army, not kill them, and basically just chase them off, you can get two fight out of one army. So you can finish this from maybe just two army groups. You get Call to Arm, which gives you replenishment, upkeep discount for five turns, and also a thousand income. And also the Rebellion starts. Now the Mandate War is officially begun. And all the minor factions have spawned in locations like this that we mentioned that we really want if they do win. And if you look at how the looters have spawned, the ones next to our main city we can handle because we have administrators. The ones next to our towns, we place generals there so we can combat the enemy threat. Huang Gai with the silver weapon can definitely kill him and use the cavalry he has uh, plus the garrison to beat back whatever this is because Huang Gai can just run over all these uh, non-spear infantry without any problem after the duel. Over here, our main army against that, no big deal. Another army off to the side, no big deal. This one will lose if they try to take the city because Luo Jun's here. And we're not going to really continue on anymore. Um, the guarantee spawn is always one here and always one here. Sometimes there's no army here. And what our goal is uh, by the way, our units. Look at what level they are. Remember, we have Prince of Chen for plus 3 rank to all range unit. Then we also have the Conscription Building for plus 2 rank. And we also um, had one more bonus, I believe, that gave us an additional one. And here we are. Incredible. Um, you also have the bow that you can equip if we had a Chancellor position. Did we never assign anyone a Chancellor? I guess we can do that right now just so that we can pick up this mission to show you guys what bow you get. You get Prince Diltron's Crossbow, which gives your units 10% extra ammo. Uh, it's a pretty decent weapon for Diltron as well. And you're all set to go. The looter shouldn't take very long, as you can see, and you're just kind of observing where the yellow turban rebels will succeed to see where you can take land. So if Zhang Liang wipes out Hene, you can march your army up and take it. Uh, your army here can definitely do that. Uh, add some cavalry if you want. Uh, once you pick up more land, have more income sources. And this army in the beginning is going to be more than sufficient. You have to use your generals. They're your front line, remember. You don't want just the enemy to walk up on you. Stall them with your generals. Liu Tong is very powerful. Very good armor. 75 armor base. Um, Zhou Tai is very powerful, needless to say. And you can round out your roster uh, with many, many uh, unique generals that will show up including those who get wiped. So like if Lu Zhu loses his piece of land and loses his faction, then there's a good chance Huang Fu Song and Lu Zhu will come to you and you can pick them up as well. So it is a fairly easy campaign. The only you know surprise you have to deal with is this turn eight looter spawn. So if you're not prepared, you could lose some land and take you a while to have your forces ready to take care of them. Essentially, you want to wait until turn eight, finish off the looters, then start targeting the John brothers and then the game uh, is pretty free after that point. So hopefully you guys enjoy this guide and see you guys next time.
Bye.